All right. So if you have questions throughout, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or uh, put in into the Zoom chat, anything like that. Uh, but yeah, so my goal here is to give you just a very brief introduction to R and hopefully make some of the, you know, some of that intimidation that can often be there for people, um, you know, maybe right away from you. And then uh, I'll maybe spend around 40, 45 minutes on that just to kind of get you up to speed. Uh, and then I'll go through about, yeah, the remainder 30 minutes or so uh, more talking through uh, the Circumplex package and how that might help you do some of the, uh, you know, work that we've seen uh, yesterday and we'll see later today. So I hope it'll be useful for you. And I'll, again, do my best to make it as accessible as possible. So for R, I think it's always good to give somebody a rationale when you're going to try to teach them something new. And so I like to think about R as uh, a bit like the engine, uh, or let's say that your computer, whether you're working on a laptop or uh, you know a desktop computer, that's kind of like the engine of a car. So the engine of a car will provide you with uh, you know lots of power to like move the car around, and you know it's much better than walking around. Uh, and so in much the same way, your computer is providing a lot of raw computational power uh, to the point where nowadays we basically have these like, you know, miracles of technology in our pockets all the time. And uh, it's a really pretty exciting time, time to live. Um, but we also need some way to control that power and direct it and steer it. And so I like to think about programming languages like R as kind of like the controls of that car. Uh, so it's not that useful to just have a computer if you don't know how to use it. And uh, so you need like a steering wheel, pedals, shifter, that kind of thing. And so programming is a great way to do this. And I often like to think about it as like almost like developing a superpower. It makes you really useful, uh, you know, in for your own work, but also really valuable as a collaborator often. Um, so that's the kind of my, you know, gist here. There, there are ways to do statistics and to do data analysis with like point and click uh, software, like, you know, SPSS, for instance. Uh, but I, I like to think about that more as like, like grabbing a taxi to get around and, you know, it'll, it'll get you there. It's good enough. Some people only use taxis, but, you know, it's expensive and it, uh, you know, kind of limits what you can do and how you can get there. Uh, whereas something like uh, R um, and other program languages like that, you know, they're free and you have much, much more control to go wherever you want, uh, however you want to do it. Uh, R Studio is not strictly necessary, but I, I, I'm going to use it and recommend that you use it. And I like to think about that as like a fancy dashboard for your car. Uh, so it basically adds a bunch of extra information, you know, like your dashboard tells you how much fuel is left and how fast you're going. And I don't know what radio station you're on. And so R Studio is going to add a lot of these handy features that uh, make it a lot easier and more comfortable to use uh, R. And then finally, uh, one of the best parts of, of R is that it includes like hundreds and thousands of, of packages, which are basically like add-ons that you can add to R. So, you know, it's a way to customize, you know, your specific computer. So, you know, like your car, you might want to add like a, a bicycle rack or a roof rack or heated seats or something. Uh, and so just like that, you know, R will have all of these extra abilities to do, you know, more visualization maybe or you know, dealing with images or, you know, doing the newest uh, statistical analyses. Um, so there's a lot of really nice packages out there. Um, I think if you sit on your laptop after using R for a long time, that might create a heated seat for you, Finn. Um, but yeah, basically we'll be talking about R packages and the Circumplex packages is one of those. So it's adding new features and functionality uh, that are very specific to, you know, interpersonal and uh, circumplex type work. So again, I had uh, usually in a workshop like this, if we had more time, I would actually walk you through installing R in R Studio. Um, but since we're tight on time, uh, I'm just gonna, you know, I put those links in chat, go install them. If you have issues, you can let me know and I'll try to help you. Uh, but once you get it installed, when we typically want to go and use R, we will start up the R Studio app on our computer. And it'll look something like this. Um, and if we call this like a window, then each of the different parts is kind of like a pane, like a pane of glass. And so the left pane here is what we call the console. And if you didn't use our studio, then this is basically what you would get when you start R. 
is it's just a big white box that you can type into. And so I like to think about this as like a chat, um, like a chat room with R. So you can send messages or commands to it and it'll, it'll return answers uh, back to you. And so we'll go through this. Um, there's some other ways to interact with R as well. And so again, if we had more time, I would teach you about scripts and R markdown and some of these more sophisticated things. Uh, but for now, we can just use the console and that's a fine way to start off when you're first learning. Um, and then on the right-hand side, this is the stuff that's like the dashboard that RStudio adds for you. So here at the top right, we have this environment pane. And as we create variables and objects, um, they will kind of get previewed up here. So it's really easy to see uh, everything you're working on uh, all there in one place, which is really quite handy. And then at the bottom right, this pane has a bunch of different tabs. And you know, so I like to think about this as the like extras pane. There's a whole bunch of different uh, parts to this. And you know, so you can see previews of files on your computer. You can see previews of plots or graphics that you generate. You can even install packages and things like that straight from here. So it's, it's really handy. And all of this stuff can be customized. Um, and so when I use R, I, I use pretty heavily customized version of this. But for teaching, I, I usually go back to the vanilla version, which is what this looks like. Okay. So when we want to actually start using the console to chat with R, I like to think about this as being a bit like talking to a genie. And so there's this, you know, trope you may be familiar with that, you know, when you talk to a genie, they'll often take you very literally. And so if you ask the genie to make you like the biggest star, you want to be like a movie star, or a, you know, singer or something um, rich and famous, the genie will like take it literally and turn you into the sun or something like that, like a literal star. And uh, so I think that talking to R is sometimes a bit like this, where it takes things very literally. Um, but just like a genie, it's like, it does have a lot of power. It's, it's really uh, worth, I think, learning how to interact with it. But you got to be pretty careful because it's, uh, you know, easily confused. And so when we learn R, it's really like learning a foreign language. And so just like you wouldn't expect to learn a foreign language in, you know, an hour and a half, you know, obviously this is just the beginning. You would need a lot of practice. You need to keep using these things uh, to get good at it. But basically what it means to master R is to really understand how do we properly phrase commands to R in a way that it'll understand and uh, appropriately respond. Uh, if we mess up and give it a command that it doesn't understand, it'll give us an error message. And then we're gonna have to try to understand what is it telling us what went wrong. Uh, and basically, in order to do this, I like to think about this as like getting theory of mind or empathy for R. Um, and so it's like R has, again, this very rigid, literal way of thinking. And so we need to put ourselves in R's shoes um, and think that, you know, if, again, if we get an error message, it's not that R is stupid or that we're stupid. It's just a, you know, a failure of communication or translation. We just need to think about, okay, what would make more sense to you? Um, you know, how can I rephrase this? Uh, and a lot of what that means in practice is that we're going to have to find and correct a lot of small mistakes. Uh, and so that's frustrating sometimes. Uh, but again, uh, hopefully it's the juice is worth the squeeze here uh, that we kind of get through that process. And in, in return, we get, again, a lot of, uh, you know, amazing ability to, uh, you know, do analyses and generate figures and things like that. Uh, so what I'd like to actually do is, you know, I could put things on the slides, but I think it's much better to actually show you. Um, and so what I'm going to do is like switch the screen I'm sharing right now uh, over to our studio. So this is what uh, our studio looks like. Um, so very similar, hopefully, to the screenshot that I just showed you. And essentially, the way that I like to think about it is, you know, you've already done some very basic programming, uh, almost certainly in your life. And an example of that is basically using a calculator is, is a lot like basic programming. And in fact, you can use R uh, like a calculator as well. So if we give it commands, uh, we could just tell it to do what we would tell a calculator to do. Like we could say, all right, uh, click in the console here and type, you know, R, what is 10 plus three? And it will respond 13. And I can uh, even zoom in a little bit here, make this a little easier for you to see it. Uh, and so whenever we type a command, you'll see that it's it's in blue. Uh, you can adjust that, but by default, it's in blue. And it starts the line with a little right-facing arrow here, or greater than sign. And then R's response will be right below it in black, and it will start with a you know number in a bracket. 
Uh, don't worry about that number. It's basically a way to keep track of if R gives you a really long output with multiple lines, uh, those bracketed numbers will help you keep track of um, the output. Uh, but the real answer it's giving us is, is here uh, after the brackets is 13. Um, and similarly, we could do uh, you know 10 minus three is seven. Uh, and although it's not required, I often like to also space out my commands so that they're a little more readable. So we could do 10 space plus space three, and then that still works uh, just as well. But now it's a little bit more human readable if I ever want to like share this code with somebody. Uh, and similarly, just like a calculator can do more than just addition and subtraction, we can do multiplication and division, we can do power, we can do parentheses, all sorts of things. Um, but we've got to use the right syntax. Um, so we got to talk to R in a way it'll understand. So if we want to do multiplication, we could do 10 and then asterisk is the command for doing multiplication in R. And then it'll do 10 times three is 30. But if you grew up using X as the multiplication operator, um, you might be confused that R gives us our first error here when we do that. And it says unexpected symbol. Uh, and so basically what it's telling you is that, you know, R uses X like letters to mean something else. It doesn't use X to mean multiplication. So it's a little bit confused and it wants us to uh, go back to using uh, asterisks for uh, multiplication and then things are fine. Uh, similarly, if we want to do division, uh, we do this type of slash that goes from the bottom left to the top right. So 10 over three. Uh, if we did the other slash that goes top left to bottom right, we would get another error. Uh, so again, R is very picky. It's very kind of rigid. Um, but again, we probably all know people like this and, you know, we can still get along with them and have a good working collaboration with them. We just need to understand kind of what their idiosyncrasies are. Uh, so that's basic, uh, you know, programming. Um, so let's go back to another slide here. And the next thing I want to talk about is a really basic but fundamental and important part of programming, uh, which is called assignment. And essentially what assignment is, is giving a name to some data. So if we have some data, like, like a number, like we just saw, or in a moment, we'll learn about storing text data in R, uh, we can store that in, a, in an object, essentially, like a variable. And if we give that object or variable a, a good name, then that'll make our uh, data easier to use and reuse. And I'll have an example of why in a moment. It's also going to make our code easier to read and write. Uh, so exa for example, if I tell you, um, you know, hey, I'd like you to pick up the phone and then dial 785-864-0841, um, you can probably do that, but it's, it's, it's a lot. It's very error prone. You could mess up one of the numbers. You could forget it. Um, you know, it's hard to go back and do that again later. Um, however, if I tell you, hey, just pick up the phone and hit the button that says office, uh, and then that'll call me, that's a lot easier to remember. Um, it's a lot less error prone. Um, and essentially it's doing the same thing. It's gonna dial these numbers, but because we gave it a good name, uh, it, it made it a lot easier. So that's the basic idea here uh, is we're gonna do the same thing in R. And we do this using assignment. So it's basically, we're gonna take some data like, a, like this phone number and we're gonna assign it a name like office. Uh, and so syntactically how we do this in R is something like this, where we give it a name like office, and then we use this arrow thing. So it's a less than and then a minus, and then our data. So we're basically taking this number and we are assigning it this name. So that's why the arrow goes this way. It's kind of the data going into the object name. And then we can just refer to it as office in the future, which again is gonna be a lot easier. Uh, so that, that's the basic kind of premise of assignment. Um, now let's go back into our studio and kind of see how that works. Uh, so if we come back here, we can essentially start doing, uh, you know, basic algebra in R. So we can say, I want a new object called lowercase x. And then I'm going to type out that assignment operator. And then I could just put a number in there, like two. And what will happen is... Basically, R won't respond, and so that might be a little confusing. I go, did it work or not? Um, but if you want to check if it worked, it's really easy. You can use the dashboard from our studio, 
and look at that environment pane. And remember I had said that the environment pane shows objects that we've temporarily created. And so here we see that X is in there and it previews the value as two. So we know that it did create it. And what's cool about this is now we can use X in place of two. So instead of doing like two times four and getting eight, I can do X times four and I'll, I'll get the same answer because to R, X is two. And so we really are just doing two times four again. We could even get more, more sophisticated and do something like, you know, take X and multiply it by X and then subtract from that 10 plus X, you know, so you can do very complicated things. And then it'll tell you that, you know, the answer of that is, is negative eight. And uh, if you ever want to see, you know, what is inside of uh, an object, you can just type its name and have that be the only command to R. So I like to think about that as like asking R, hey, R, what is an X? And it'll come back and say, oh, two, two is currently an X. Um, so if we ever want to update X and say, okay, right now it's two, but actually I've changed my mind. I want X to be three. All we have to do is just reassign it. So we can say X is, and then the arrow operator, and then three. And now if we look up in the environment, you can see that it's now three. We can also uh, print it, which is what we call it when we just type the name in, and it'll respond three. Okay. Now, if you ever get to the point where you are kind of getting to the end of your console like this, um, it's okay to just keep going and it'll keep pushing it down. But you can also click this little um, broom icon at the top right of the console pane, and that'll clean it out for you, uh, which can be handy sometimes. Okay, uh, one final thing to know about assignment is that R is case sensitive. So if we assign, uh, let's say, a number to the lowercase q, we make lowercase q 10. We could print it and see that it's 10. But then if we assign the uppercase Q to 20, then we'll see that uppercase Q is 20, but lowercase Q is still 10. And you can see that actually in the environment, we actually have two separate objects now. We have Q lowercase is 10 and Q uppercase is 20. Uh, so just be careful about that, that if you want to update an object or kind of overwrite it, make sure you spell it exactly the same way. Uh, or you might end up with just a duplicated thing that differs uh, slightly. Um, so that's the basics uh, of assignment. And what's nice about this is basically that you can give them these nice names. Uh, but so far, we've just used really simple names like X and Q. Um, and in practice, I actually recommend that you use more, um, let's say, declarative or descriptive names. And so you can use many different names, uh, and that's okay, but there are some rules that you're gonna have to learn. And so you'll make mistakes at first, but after you do this enough, it'll become second nature. You can just look at a name and be able to tell like, oh, that there's something wrong with that. Um, just like you can look at a sentence in English and be like, the grammar is off, I'm not exactly sure how. Um, but the rules are that you can only include letters, numbers, underscores, and periods in your variable names. Um, so you can't include spaces, no dashes, no percent signs, no crazy characters, uh, no emojis or anything like just simple letters, numbers, underscores, and periods. And then the only other rule is that it must start with a letter or a period. So that first character in the name has to be a letter or a, a period. It can't be a number or an underscore. And again, that's a little weird, a little arbitrary, uh, but those are just the rules that we're going to have to learn. And then again, because names are case sensitive, something like age with a lowercase a is a different object than age with an uppercase a. Okay, so very easy to, you know, get confused or make mistakes uh, because of that. Uh, but but that's the basic idea. Um, so let's head back again into our studio. Hopefully, you're not getting dizzy by switching back and forth. Um, so now let's say that we have some number, let's say 93, and we want to use that and save it so other people can, you know, I don't know, use it or something. Uh, so we can give it a name like X, uh, but then it's not really clear, like, what, what is this number 93? Um, and so if we give it a, a better name, we might be able to communicate better what it actually is. So I'll give you kind of the Goldilocks treatment here and say, like, uh, you can have a name that's too short. So something like 
we could name that 93 is rate. And that's like, okay, but it's not really, it's like, what kind of rate? And what, what is this actually describing? Uh, you can also have it be too, too long and have it be something like, you know, heart rate in beats per minute is 93. And again, that's okay. It, you know, R accepts it. It doesn't violate any rules, but it, it's really long. It's kind of unwieldy. You have to type that out every time you want to use it. So you want to find that nice, happy middle ground, something maybe like heart rate is 93. Um, and then that'll actually store kind of what you actually want it to be, you know, giving it something like a name like office or, or office phone, but not like the phone number of my office in room 454. Uh, you know, that would be a bit too long um, to really use effectively. And then we also want to make sure that we abide by those rules that I just laid out. So we could not do something like heart space rate is 93. We'll get an error because spaces are not allowed. You also can't do minuses. So we can't do heart dash rate is 93. That's not allowed. We get an error basically because R wants to use this dash sign as subtraction. And so it needs to reserve it for that. It's very, again, kind of rigid. Uh, similarly, you can't do symbols. So even though it might be nice to have a name like, you know, age and then the at sign time two is maybe 12, you'll get an error because that at sign is not allowed in variable names. So instead, I typically just replace symbols with underscores. So we could have age underscore time two is 12 and that works. No problem. We can print it back and, it, and, and it's fine. Okay. And then finally, we could do something like heart underscore rate underscore one is 93. And then we could have maybe have heart rate two and three and four. Um, that's okay. But we cannot do one underscore heart underscore rate because it can't start with a number. Okay, we get an error here. So you can have numbers. They just can't be that first, first character. Okay. Any questions about assignment or naming? Okay, uh, in the interest of time then, I'll keep going. Hopefully that's a sign that things are pretty clear. Uh, so the next thing, uh, so yeah, you can just think about variables as objects. Uh, the only reason I use the word object and not the word variable is that variable usually just means like a single number, but in R, objects are more flexible. They Like an object could contain a number, it could contain a lot of numbers, it could contain text, it could contain an image. Um, so yeah, it, it's like a variable, but it's even more flexible than that. Uh, but good question. Uh, so one of the other things that's another fundamental part of programming, not, not just R, but programming in general, is what are called functions. And functions are really, really useful, one of the best parts of using a programming language. And I like to think about them as recipes. So a recipe will basically let you uh, cook up a tree. Uh, and essentially, you have some in input to the recipe that's like your ingredients. Like maybe you take some sugar and milk and apples or something. Uh, and then you go through a number of steps that are defined by your recipe. And those steps basically transform your ingredients into your final product, like an apple pie or whatever it is you're making, uh, strudel or something. Um, and so that's the basic idea. You have some input. That's the ingredients. You have some steps. And then you have some output, which is the final treat. And that's basically the same idea, uh, same template for what a function does in R, is it's going to have some inputs, and we call those arguments. And then it has one or more lines of code in it that transform those inputs. So maybe you put a number in, and it transforms that number somehow, and then gives you back, instead of a treat, it gives you back a transformed number. Or maybe you give a function a, a bunch of numbers, and it calculates their average or their um, sum or something like that. Uh, but that's the basic idea. And the way that you use a function in R, there's kind of a telltale sign that you're using a function. And that's when you have parentheses. Uh, and so basically, the way that you would set this up is you would say that you're going to use assignment to create a new object called out, or whatever you want to call the, the output of it, you could name it, you know, pi or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then you assign it. Uh, then the output of the function. So every function has a name, and I'll show you some in a moment. 
but let's say we have a function called f, then you do f and then open parentheses. So that's the sign you're using a function. And then inside of the parentheses, you're going to then give it one or more um, inputs or arguments. And if you have more than one, you separate them by commas. Okay. So again, it's going to take a little bit of time to understand and memorize these rules, but this will become really second nature to you after you do it for like an hour. Um, so let's again, dive into our studio and uh, actually play with this a little bit. So I'll clear out the console again, and I'll share these slides uh, that have all of the code that I'm using so that if you want to go back and do this again by yourself, you can in the future. Uh, but let's say that you want to do something like you want to take the square root of a uh, number. So one way you could do this is you could say, let's take a number like nine, and then we can raise that to a power. And the way that you raise something to the power is with this uh, up arrow, it's called a caret. And then you tell it, well, what power do you want to raise it to? And so you might remember, or you might not, uh, but to take the square root of something, you, you just raise it to the one half power. So we could do nine to the one over two power. And then it'll tell us that, okay, the square root then of nine is three. So you don't need a function to do this. You could just do this with basic math, um, but there's a really convenient way to do the same thing um, using a function. So what we can do is we can say, let's make a new object called X. And then we wanna put inside of X, so I can do the little arrow operator here. I wanna put in there the square root of nine. And so there's a function called SQRT, so kind of like square root um, with all the, I guess, vowels removed. And then because it's a function name, we want to then put parentheses. And then inside of it, square root takes just one ingredient, one input, or one argument. And that is the number that you want to square root. So we can put in nine here. And then if we print x, we'll see that we get three. So this is really basically doing the exact same thing that we did here. It's just a different way of doing it. And I like this better because it is a lot more readable. You know, if, even if somebody doesn't remember that, you know, raising something to the one half power square roots it, they might be able to figure out that this is square root. Um, and also one of the things I'll mention in just a moment is that functions let you customize their behavior, um, which is even better than doing it by hand. Um, so let's see an example of that. So let's say we have a number like two over three, so two thirds, and that is, you know, 0.6 repeating. And let's say that we want to round that number. Um, so you might be thinking, okay, well, I don't, I have no idea how to round a number, um, you know, using algebra or, you know, mathematics, um, like pluses and minus and things like that. Um, but this is built into R as a function. So we use the round function. So we could say that maybe x is equal to, or we assign to uh, the round or the rounding of, and then one argument you give it is just the number that you want to round. So we could say, okay, round two over three. And then we print that and it rounds it to the nearest whole number. So 0.6 repeating rounded to the nearest whole number is, is rounding up to one. And so that's that's pretty handy. Um, but what's even better about this is that we don't need to have a separate function for rounding to a whole number versus rounding to one digit or two digits or three digits. The round function can do all of those uh, just by taking in another argument. So what we would do is we would say that x is round of two thirds, and then we need to give it another argument. And so to give it another argument, we do comma, because arguments always have to be separated by commas. And then we can give it the name of the argument that we want to use, which is called digits. And then we do equals, and then the number of digits we want to round to. So let's say we want to round it to two digits. If we uh, send that to R and then print X, you'll see that now instead of 0.6 a bunch of times, we just have 0.67. So it's rounded it to just two digits as we asked it to. So basically this is using a function and then based on what you make the second argument, the digits argument, you can customize its behavior. Uh, and so again, this is a really powerful way 
of like reusing your functions um, to get different outputs. And as we'll see when we learn the Circuplex package, I, I built in a bunch of arguments so that you can customize things uh, exactly how you want them to be. Um, and then also, if you hit up the up arrow on your keyboard, you can go back to previous uh, commands that you've entered. So if I hit up twice, we're back to, to this command. And then if I change digits to three, then you'll see that uh, X is now 0.667. So again, we can round to any number of digits. Um, and you know, that's one of the benefits of, uh, you know, again, using R and using functions. Okay, just a couple more basic things to teach you about R before we get into um, the package. Uh, often we want to deal with not just a single number or a single object uh, like we've been doing, but we might actually want to deal with like a bunch of numbers together somehow. And so those are what we call in R a vector. And so I like to think about vectors as combining or collecting uh, many similar objects into a collection. And the, the analogy that I use, the metaphor I use is, is like a train with many cars. So if we have a bunch of numbers that we put one number in each car, and then we can still refer to them individually, but they're also now part of this collective, this entire train. Uh, and so like the train itself is the vector, and then each car or each object in it is what we call an element. So this would be, let's say, a five element vector. And I'll go through a bunch of examples of this. Now, one of the reasons that you would want to collect numbers um, or other objects into a vector is because a lot of functions behave differently um, if you give them a vector versus just a single object. So some functions will actually do like an assembly line thing where it'll go through every uh, elements or every car of the train one by one and transform each one. And so you could say like, okay, take this train and then double the amount of cargo in every car. So after doing this function, you'll still have a train with, you know, five cars, but now it's been transformed somehow. It's been doubled or maybe halved or whatever you want to do to it. Uh, and then other functions actually do a summary across the elements. So you give it five numbers and then it gives you back like one where it'll say like, what's the sum of all of these numbers or what's the, the mean, the average, you know, the standard deviation, like whatever you want to uh, calculate from them, it'll give you that kind of summary. Okay. So the way that you create a vector in R is using a function, which we just learned about. And this is such a common function that you do so frequently in R that it has a really, really short name. So you don't have to type it out all the time, like really long. And that function is just called lowercase c, which I remember by saying like collect or combine. So if we want to make a new vector called v, then we do v and then arrow. And then the c function, make sure it's lowercase. And then inside of the function, you just give it as separate arguments, each of the elements you want to combine. So you could say, okay, make a vector with the numbers one, two, and three, and then that'll collect them. Instead of being three separate objects, it's just one object that has three uh, elements in it. Okay, so let's go back into our studio and, and play with vectors a little bit. So let's say we have some numbers here, um, and let's say we want to save them to to x. Well, then you might be tempted to just type the numbers out and like separate them by spaces or something. So let's say we have like four and nine and 16 and 25. But if you do it that way, then R gets confused and you get an error. Because again, if you at any time you want to collect multiple things into a single object, you're always going to have to use uh, a vector. So we'll do X and then arrow and then C and then we'll open parentheses and then we can put our numbers in there. Uh, separated by commas. So 4, comma 9, comma 16, comma 25. Now there's no error. And if we print X, you'll see that we get all four of our numbers back. Okay. Uh, similarly, we could make another small vector, Y, that just contains the numbers 2 and 3. So, you know, it doesn't matter how many you have in there, you can have any number. And uh, what's cool about this is then we could even combine the vectors together. We can kind of merge them together like two trains joining up. So we can make a new object Z that combines X and Y. 
And now Z is 4, 9, 16, 25, 23, uh, or 25, 2, and 3. Okay. And now the reason that you would want to do this, like I said before, is so that you can do operations on all of your numbers uh, all at once very easily. So let's say we wanted to take every one of our um, numbers here and add one to it. Instead of having to go through and, uh, like, let's say, access four numbers in it, instead of having to do plus one four different times, we can just say x plus one, and then you get 5, 10, 17, 26. So this is a really efficient way of uh, doing your operations. Like imagine you had 2 million rows or 2 million numbers and you want to add one to every one. You, you don't want to do 2 million uh, addition operations. Um, you you want to just be able to say X plus one, and then it'll apply that for you across all of them, uh, which again is really handy. Uh, and that's not just a plus thing. You could do like X times three, and then it'll multiply every element by three. You could even do functions this way, like you could do the square root of x. Oh, I think I froze for a moment there. Sorry about that. You could do the square root of x, and then it'll go through every one of your numbers. It'll take the square root of 4, that's 2, the square root of 9, that's 3, and so on. Uh, you could also transform them other ways, like you could take the log of x, and then it log transforms every one of those numbers. Um, so this ends up being really useful when you want to do like transformations before statistical tests or something like that. Uh, but not all functions work this way where it, you know, transforms every element. Like I said, some of them actually summarize or condense down to a smaller number of numbers. So something like if you want to know how many elements are in X, you could say length of X and it'll tell you, okay, there's four numbers, right? Four, nine, 16, 25. There's four numbers in there. Or you can say, what's the sum of all of those numbers? And it'll tell you that's 54. Or what's the mean of those numbers? And that's 13.5. So again, we're now starting to really leverage the power of your computer. Like if you were to ask me personally in my head to average those numbers, that would take me a lot longer than it just took R. Um, so that, again, a real benefit here. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions about uh, vectors or about any of the stuff we've talked about so far? Okay. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, is what are called strings. And strings are uh, really helpful in R for when we want to tell R not a command like let's say the function mean, but we actually want to give it like the letters M-E-A-N as like text data or something like that, or as like the label to put on a plot. Um, in those cases, we need to basically tell R uh, and distinguish between, you know, when we're actually issuing a command, like call the mean function, and when we're just giving it text, like the letters M-E-A-N. And the way we do that is by basically creating what are called strings. And strings are basically R's way of storing text data. And what's really nice about them is unlike variable names, which we learned about have all these rules attached to them, strings have no rules. Uh, you can have spaces, you can have symbols, you can have emojis, whatever you want is fine in there. Uh, I guess the only rule, the one rule that there is, is that in order to tell R that you're making a string, you have to start and end, or what I call wrap, like W-R-A-P, you have to wrap that text in quotation marks. And then that'll be the way of telling R, this is you know, just text data, treat it as such. And one of the nice things is that R has all these great tools for working with strings. We can combine multiple strings into a vector like we did with numbers. Uh, and we can use functions to transform our strings to like change its capitalization, to calculate the frequency of different letters, to do all sorts of things that might be useful uh, for instance, if we study the language that people use, um, uh, things like that. So an example of this would be, let's say we want to store um, the, the letters J-O-H-N space D-O-E. Well, that's not a valid variable name. Um, but if we just want that to actually be the letters or the characters John Doe, then we can just basically wrap that in quotation marks. You can use single quotes or double quotes. And then we can give that um, you know, object a name, 
like in this case, name, okay? Or first name, F name, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that, that's the basic kind of intuition for working with strings in R. And if we want to then do this in R, to kind of show you an example, let's say that we ask somebody, what's, what's your favorite color? And they say, oh, my color is red. So you might then want to make an object in R called my color and then assign that, you know, red. But if you do it just like this, you just type out red, so you don't make it a string, you'll get an error. And it'll basically say, you know, I'm looking for an object named RED. Um, and I see X, I see rate, I see heart rate. I don't see red. Um, so instead, we need to let R know, You're like, no, 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 not, not an object named red, just, just the text. And again, the way we do that is by saying, you know, my color is, and then in quotes, red. Now we get no error. And if we print my color, we get back red in quotes. Now we're in good shape. Um, similarly, if we wanted to have special symbols in there, we can do that. So we can say that, you know, the die that I'm using to, you know, in this experiment is uh, red number 40. Well, you're not allowed to have, you know, pound signs tip normally, uh, but inside of a string, that's fine. It's no problem. Um, similarly, let's say we have multiple dies and we want to make a vector. Well, we can just use the C function to collect or combine, um, you know, red number 40 and blue number two. And then if we print it, you'll see that we now have a vector with two elements and those elements are both strings. Uh, one thing to be really careful about though, is that uh, you want to basically put the comma that separates them outside of the quotes. So it's like saying this is string number one. That's the first argument, then a comma, then in quotes, the second string, the second argument. Okay. If I had done like, um, like this, we would end up with an error. Okay. Now, like I said before, there are some functions in R that can help you transform and deal with string data. So there's a bunch, but just a quick example would be, I can do something like, you know, let's count how many characters are in each of these strings. And so there's a function called N for number and then car for like characters. And then if I give it dies, it will then go through each one of my strings and count how many characters it has. So we get back a vector six and seven, because, you know, red number 40 contains R, E, D, pound, four, zero. That's uh, six characters. So it's not counting the quotes. And then uh, blue number two has seven characters. Um, so again, this is, a, you know, going to be important, uh, as you'll see later on. We're, we'll sometimes need to tell R, uh, you know, text, data, things like that. Uh, and we would always want to do that by wrapping it in quotation marks. Okay, uh, just I think two more kind of intros uh, to our things and then we'll get into circumplex. Um, but in order to use circumplex, we need to learn a little bit more about packages. And so I had said before that packages are like add-ons to your car. Uh, well, as a bonus metaphor, you can also think about them as like cookbooks. So like I said, a function is like a recipe. And so a cookbook collects many recipes. And so there's lots of recipes and instructions in a cookbook. And so if you want to like go learn to do new things in the kitchen, you might go to an online bookstore, you might order a cookbook and then add it to your personal bookshelf in your kitchen. Um, but you might have a lot of uh, cookbooks. You don't want to have all of them open at all times. And so whenever you want to actually use a specific cookbook or a recipe from a specific cookbook, you then also need to like pull it off of your bookshelf and open it up in your kitchen to the appropriate page. Um, so this is a similar process that we'll have to use uh, in order to use a package in R. If we want to add new functions and also data sets, then we can install a package. Uh, but in order to do this, we need to go to what we call a repository. This is sort of like an online you know, bookstore um, or a library, but it, all of the uh, packages on the repository are free. So it's like a bunch of free cookbooks. And then just like we would need to order a cookbook and add it to our bookshelf, we will need to install the package and add it to our personal library. 
which is like a folder on our computer that contains all of our packages. And then anytime we want to actually use a package, we will have to then load it, which is sort of the equivalent of taking it off the bookshelf and opening it. And the reason that it doesn't just load all of your packages every time you start R is that you know you might end up over time collecting a lot of packages. So like I have probably thousands of packages on my computer. If it loaded every package every time I started R, um, I'd have to wait like a minute or two or maybe even longer uh, to load all those packages. I don't want to wait that long. So basically, instead, every time that I sit down to use R, I will then think about you know what what functions do I want to use, what packages do I need to load, and then I'll load just a handful of packages that I'm using that day, and then you keep everything nice and um, you know kind of tidy and streamlined. Uh, so I'll show you uh, R Studio also gives us some really convenient ways to install packages. So I'll show you that. And what we can do here is inside of our studio, uh, in this extras pane down at the bottom right, if we go over to the packages tab, you'll see that there's a list of packages. Like I said, I have a whole bunch here already. You probably have fewer, but that's fine. And it also includes this button called install, which is really, really useful. So if you click install, it opens up this little menu here. And it automatically says, remember I said that a repository is, um, you know, like a bookstore. So the, the main repository for our packages is called CRAN. And that's an acronym that stands for like um, the R Archive Network, Comprehensive R Archive Network. And then you could just start typing in what packages you want to install. So um, for this workshop, we're going to be working with the Circumplex package. And I went through a long and arduous process of getting my package added to CRAN. Um, they're very careful about this. They don't let people upload packages that are, you know, broken or predatory or anything like that. Um, so you can feel pretty safe with that. And then it'll install it to your library, which, like I said, is just a folder on your computer. Um, and so this is the default folder, but you could change that if you want to. Um, make sure that you have the install dependencies checked. Sometimes packages build on each other. And so that's called like a dependency. And so if my package builds on another one, then in order to use mine, you also have to install the other one. Um, so again, if you check that box and hit install, then it's going to take care of all of that for you. It'll go find the package and it'll install it and all of its dependencies. Um, so that's good. And, uh, and yeah, uh, later on, we will start using the circumplex package. We're not quite ready to do that yet, although we're really close. Um, but like I said, we've now gone from having the package up in the cloud, like only in the repository online. And once we install it, it's now on our computer. But ours not actually ready to use it yet. Uh, because again, it's like, it's in our house, but it's not open. It's not ready to be used. And so the final step is, again, every time you sit down to use R, and, you know, like after you restart your computer or you restart our studio or whatever, you're going to have to then load the packages you want to use. So I'm going to then do that by using the library function. So I'll say library. And then the argument that it takes is the name of the package you want to load. And so I want to load circumplex. And I can hit enter. And now we're good. Now I can use circumplex and uh, any of the functions or any of the data sets that it provides are just available to me really easily and simply. Um, so that that's really handy. Uh, but don't forget to do that, or it's not going to be able to find any of the functions or data sets that, that you're trying to use. Um, OK, and then one final note is that you know occasionally, they're going to release updates to packages. So maybe I'll add a new feature to Circumplex, or some other package that you use might have some bug fixes. And so then you'll want to update your packages every once in a while. Uh, but again, if you have like thousands of functions or thousands of packages, that's could be a real hassle. Um, but if you use our studio next to the install button, there's this update button. And what it does is it automatically scans through all of your packages and checks the repository to see, are there any new updated versions of any of your packages? And if there are, it'll list them here. And then you can choose which ones you want to install. So basically, typically every morning, I think about it as like Christmas morning, you know, I run downstairs, I look under the tree and see, are there any uh, package updates available? I then hit select all and install updates and just keep everything up to date so that I have all the newest features and all the newest bug fixes. 
Uh, but you can choose if you want to be quite so obsessive uh, about that as I am. Um, okay, so then the final thing that I want to show you about R is, you know, we'll use a little bit of data set, like example data sets just that are included in the uh, circumplex package. But in, in real life, when you're using this, you're probably going to want to load in a uh, data file. And so I want to just show you how to do that while uh, I have your attention here. And uh, basically the process of importing data from a file into R, like as an object in your environment, um, is called importing or reading. And then if you ever make changes, like I'll show you how to adjust things and add variables and things like that um, in R, then you might want to then write it back to a file so that you could then have it stored outside of R. You could, you know, send it to somebody, back it up, whatever you want to do. And so then the process of taking an object in R's environment and actually writing it to a file on your computer is called exporting or writing. So I'll show you how to do both. Luckily, uh, R makes this quite easy. And there's many, many different types of uh, files that you could store your data in. So I'm just going to show you how you can use a uh, CSV, so a comma separated values uh, file. And this I like for beginners in particular because it's a simple file that is both human readable, like you could open it in a text editor and see the data. You can open it in a program like Excel or Google Sheets and see the data. Uh, but it's also pretty easy to read for a computer. So it's a nice balance to meet your needs and ours needs. And you can then share that with other people and they don't need any special software to open it. They can just open it in you know, commonly available, freely available software. Um, so you can use a package called Tidyverse um, that'll add some functions to read in things like CSVs or various text files. Um, but also, you know, if you have other types of files like Excel files, you can use the read Excel package. If you have um, you know, files maybe that a collaborator sent you from SPSS, or from SAS or from MATLAB, then Haven can often read those in. You can even read in data from Google Sheets. Um, so commonly what I'll do is I'll get data from something like Qualtrics or from some you know, experiment software, and then I'll read it into R and then manipulate it uh, inside of R. Um, but just wanted to kind of you know, show, like tell you that you can read in almost anything, but for right now, I'm gonna keep it simple and just show you how to read in a CSV. So, if I go to my files tab here, you, you don't have to do this, but just to show you, it'll show you whatever the current folder that R has open is and all the files in there. So this is like the folder that contains my presentation documents. And inside of here, I've put in a CSV file uh, called jz2017.csv. And so this is some sample data from uh, one of Johannes Zimmerman and Aiden Wright's papers from 2017. And so we'll be playing with that today a little bit. And so if I want to read this in, all I have to do is um, I can go to packages and install. And then I can type in tidyverse. So again, that's the package that, uh, that I like to use to, to do a lot of data science -y things. And I can install that. OK, uh, I already had that installed, so it was really quick for me. It'll probably take a little bit longer for you. Um, and then once I've installed it, I can then load it by typing a library tidyverse. And one thing I don't love about tidyverse is it gives you this long message that scares people a lot, um, but that's not a problem. It's just giving you information about the dependencies that, that it calls. Uh, and even though there's X's here, don't worry, there's, there's no error. Uh, it's fine. And one of the reasons that we want to use tidyverse is so that we can have this um, function called read underscore CSV. So I can say, let's make a new object in R called my underscore data. And that is going to then be the output of the function read underscore CSV. And then as a string, so in quotes, I give it the name of that file, which again was jz2017.csv. And it'll tell me, OK, I just read in a table. We haven't really talked about tables yet, but I don't have time to. Um, so just trust me that it'll just read in a table for you. Don't worry too much about that. Um, and so that table has 100, or sorry, 1,000, uh, 166 rows and 19 columns. If we want to preview the data, we can just type its name and print it. And it'll give us a little preview. 
Or if we want to view it in even more detail, we can do the view function and do view my data. And then it'll open up a, um, yeah, I will. Sorry about that. Um, actually, the um, if you want to follow along, this data set is actually part of the package. So if you load circumplex, you can just type Jay-Z 2017 and it'll pull it up. So you don't actually need the CSV. This is just an example of uh, how to do it if you did have a CSV. Uh, but then here you'll have, uh, you know, in the kind of a spreadsheet view, you'll see that, okay, we have a gender variable and then we have a bunch of participants and their genders. And then we have PA, BC, DE, FG. So these are a bunch of circumplex uh, octant scores and then some scales that have to do with personality pathology. So like paranoid PD, schizoid PD, schizotypal PD, and so on. And so this is, you know, like a big data table, like you might read in from Excel or uh, CSV, that kind of thing. Uh, but now it's stored in this object called my underscore data. So you'll be able to then use that. Uh, and then if you ever want to, you know, let's say you make some changes to this, which I'll show you how to do in a little bit. And then if we ever want to then write it to a new file to again, save or send to somebody, um, instead of doing read CSV, we just do write CSV. So write underscore CSV. And then you have to give it two arguments. The first argument is the data. So that's my underscore data. So that table. And then we also have to give it the file. So we'll say file equals. And then as a string, you give it the name of whatever um, file you want to create to store this data on your computer. So let's say we want to name it you know, my updated data dot CSV, then you can hit enter. And after a couple seconds, if we go back to the files tab, you'll see that it has now created a new file in that folder called my updated data dot CSV. So again, this is actually, we didn't do anything to it. We just read it in and then wrote it out the same thing. But in practice, you typically make some changes to it and then write it out again. Okay, um, so that's the end of my kind of brief intro to R. Um, any questions about any of this before we then start playing with the circumplex package? Okay. I think we're doing okay on time. I think we, we started a little later than I was expecting, but um, hopefully I can uh, make up a little bit of time. Um, for the circumplex package, um, it's all lowercase uh, circumplex. And uh, I, I usually just refer to packages with the, these squiggly braces around them just to make it clear that I'm referring to a package, um, but the name actually doesn't include them. So it's just sort of like a denotation of, of a package name. And so this was basically my attempt to make functions for people um, that would you know, help them do various uh, you know, circumplex related tasks in R. And so I'll tell you some of the basic stuff here, uh, but if you ever find that there's stuff that you wish it would do or that would be handy to you, uh, feel free to shoot me an email and there's a possibility I can add it. Um, you know, I've never gotten any funding to support this effort, so, um, so it might be a little slow for me to make updates, but uh, you know, I do try to keep, keep on top of things with it. Um, so to give you kind of an overview, uh, essentially the way that I like to think about it is the first step is you're gonna input some data so maybe you, you read in a CSV file that contains your data. And then you have some functions from the package that will help you kind of uh, tidy up the data and get it ready for analysis. So let's say maybe you have all of your uh, data in items. So you have like, let's say, you know, 32 items um, in every person's score on each item of the IIP. Um, or I guess the IPSC would have 32, IIP would have 64, but you have a bunch of columns and, but you wanna analyze not the individual items, you wanna analyze like the scales, the octant scores. Um, and so in that case, I have a function called score and it will automatically score for you, um, you know, most major circumflex instruments. Now I don't have all of them in here, but I have most of the main ones. And if I'm missing any, let me know and I'll try to add it. Uh, similarly, a lot of these um, data sets, um, or sorry, a lot of these instruments have uh, normative data attached to them. And so you might want to compare your data to the normative um, sample from the package. Uh, some people think that's a good idea, some people don't. But if you want to, I have this function standardized that will do that for you as well. So it makes it really easy to do things like scoring your data 
and standardizing it um, relative to normative data. Um, and then once you have the data ready, then you're typically going to want to do some sort of analysis. And the two main types of analysis that are currently built into Circumplex are uh, both related to SSM. So I'll be giving you a little crash course on SSM in a moment, but this is the structural summary method. This is how you take octant scores and then actually plot them in the circle, um, which you've probably seen at, I think, uh, Betsy's talk um, yesterday, and you'll probably see more later today. Um, and you do that with SSM Analyze. That's how you would analyze like a group of people um, or a measure that you want to like project into that space using correlations. So that's SSM Analyze. And then occasionally people also ask me, you know, I'm interested in not just projecting like a group of people or a variable into that space. I want to just score every single person and get their SSM parameters for each person individually. And so then SSM score is a function that will just add columns to your data set that have each person's SSM elevation and uh, amplitude and displacement, that kind of thing. Um, so if you don't know what that means yet, you know, we'll get there in just a moment. Um, but then you'll end up with some results data. And then finally, I have some functions built in to create some nice uh, formatted tables for you that you could like put directly into a paper um, and also some plots that you could then put into a presentation or a figure uh, or a poster, that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that most of the, you know, pl uh, plots that you'll see throughout the, the uh, conference nowadays are probably uh, using these functions as well. So if you think they look cool, uh, it might be worth checking out the package. Um, so the first set of um, functions or kind of features that I added uh, most recently is I added a whole bunch of stuff about the instruments. And so this is, I did give a talk about some of the SSM stuff in 2018, um, but this stuff is newer than that. So this will be new to, I think, a lot of people. And essentially, you know, we have in the field a lot of different circumplex questionnaires, some, you know, by Ken Locke that we talked about yesterday in the keynote, uh, others by other people that are present here. And I think to support the community using these, um, you know, I wanted to basically put a centralized location to store information about all of those. So essentially what you can do is you can browse and learn about these instruments through the package, as well as through the package website that I'll show you at the end. And so this contains information like who created each instrument, what paper should you cite if you use that instrument, um, what are the response options and anchors uh, or labels um, for the instrument, what are the item numbers and the item text. Um, I don't have the text for all of them. If they're proprietary, I'm not allowed to share the text, but you know, a lot of the instrument creators have been gracious enough to let me post the full text there. Um, I also have instructions on how to score each of the scales by hand as well as, like I said, the ability to automatically score it within the package. Uh, and then I also went through and collected as many normative data sets as I could, um, like the means and SDs of every one of the octant scales, so that you can, if you want to, standardize your data relative to that normative data, basically with uh, a very simple command. Uh, and then in addition to just learning, it'll also automatically score your item level data and automatically norm or standardize your scale level data, should you wish to do that. Um, so again, my hope is that this is really uh, useful. Um, so let's go into R and actually see what this looks like. So uh, I'm going to close this my data preview. Um, it still exists here, but uh, it's just closing the preview. And then I've already loaded the library for Circumplex, I believe. Uh, but just in case, I can do the library again, uh, make sure it's open. And then if you want to ever view from inside of R, you know, what are the instruments that the, the package contains information about? You can just type in instruments and then open close parenthesis. So this is basically a function that I made that has no arguments. So that's why you just open and close the parentheses. And then it'll print back to you um, in the console, you know, that, okay, currently there's 13 instruments included. Uh, ranging from the circumplex scales of interpersonal efficacy down to the interpersonal sensitivity circumplex. And, uh, you know, you have the little um, label for each, like the abbreviation, the full name, and then also in parentheses here, this little code. And so if we ever want the package to give us information about one of these instruments, we need to use this code. So if you ever need to look up what were those codes again, you could just do instruments. And then that'll tell you what all the codes are. But usually they're pretty uh, self-explanatory. 
So then if you want to know about an instrument, you can say, okay, I'm really interested in this, let's say the CSIP. I can go down and say uh, print CSIP and it'll print a very brief information blurb about it that says that this is the scale. It has 64 items, eight scales, one normative data set. Um, at least in the package, there's one normative data set. Maybe there's more. Um, and then it was uh, created by these authors. And if you want to read more about it, this is the uh, DOI to the paper. Uh, if you want even more detailed information, instead of doing print and then the name or the code, you do summary and then the code. And then you get all this information. Um, so the same little block here, but then also the eight uh, octant scales and their names and then their circular um, location. You have the anchors. Um, so this was scored on a zero to three scale with these labels. And then because this one's open access, we have all of the items um, in order. So you could just copy this into Word or something if you wanted to use it or copy it into Qualtrics. Um, so again, trying to make this as easy as possible. And then uh, the normative data set, currently there's one that came in the original paper that's 712 American college students. So if you wanted to, you could compare your data straight to that. Um, so yeah, so then the final thing I want to show you here is let's say that we have some data um, that's item level, like raw data. So just to get a little more room, I'll clear the console. And I have some data already built into the package called raw underscore IIPSC. So this is the inventory of interpersonal problems, uh, short circumplex. And you'll see here that it ends up, you know, we have this table basically where we have uh, 10 rows, so 10 people, and then every column is their response to a single item from that instrument. So let's say we want to calculate their scores on the IAPSC octants. You can just do, uh, let's make a new object called um, IAPSC scores. You can name it anything as long as it obeys the rules of naming. And then we can do something like um, score. So that's the name of the function from circumplex that does this. And then you need to give it a couple arguments. So the first argument is the data. So you'd say that it's coming from raw IIPSC. And then you tell it, okay, well, because that uh, table might have lots of columns that aren't related to the IIP, um, we have to tell it which columns are related. So we say the items are, so items equals, and then you could have a vector where you type out IIP01, IIP02, IIP03, um, and all of them in order, but that's that's annoying, right? So I put a shortcut in where instead of doing a vector, you can do a shortcut where you say IIP01 colon IIP32, and then it'll look and find the column that says IIP01, the column that says IIP32, and it'll pull all of the columns between those two. So as long as your data has these columns in order, like one to 32, and as long as there's nothing else in between those two, you can use the shortcut. And then finally, you have to tell it in order to score it properly, you have to tell it which instrument this is. So you would say instrument equals, and then IIPSC, hit enter, and that's it. Now, if we go to view IIPSC scores, then you'll see we have the same table we had before. But if we scroll all the way to the right, it's added now eight new columns that are the scores of the um, uh, IAPSC octants. Um, so it makes it really easy to score these. So you don't have to go and look up, you know, oh gosh, you know, which items were from which scale and which are reverse coded and, you know, that kind of thing. It just takes care of all of that for you. Um, so again, hopefully that's pretty handy. And then we could then do some analysis using these octant scales. Um, you could also norm it. I'm not going to show you how to norm it here. If you're interested, um, you can read more about that on the website. Um, but we're almost out of time. So I'm going to move forward a little bit. Um, so the last thing that I want to show you is that basically you can use the uh, package to do some basic uh, SSM or structural summary method analysis, as well as more advanced SSM analysis. And if you're not that familiar, the structural summary method is, um, okay, yeah, I mean, if I could have a little extra time, that would help a lot, Thane. Um, so basically, this is a way, I'll, I'll give you a, a very brief overview on this slide, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, 
it's basically a way of taking the circumplex scale scores. So usually those are octants, so eight scores around different points of the circle and summarizing that or reducing it. Um, so instead of having eight numbers, we're just going to have three. So it's a more parsimonious, almost like a dimensionality reduction technique. And what's nice about this is that every one of these three numbers, what we call the SSM parameters, uh, has like a distinct interpretation and also allows us to plot um, every person or group or correlate within the circular space. Um, so I'll show you how we do that in a moment. Um, but then the other thing that's really nice and that again is handled completely for you by the package is that the original SSM didn't do any statistical inference. So there was no uncertainty estimate, there were no p-values, no confidence intervals, uh, no statistical testing. It was just a data reduction technique. Uh, but then you know Zimmerman and Wright uh, basically proposed using bootstrapping or resampling um, to, to get statistical inference and uncertainty estimates out of this. And so I built that into the package. It does bootstrapping for you. Uh, and I'm working now also on adding um, Markov chain Monte Carlo resampling, but that's not quite ready yet. Um, so a quick use case. This is, I'll use the example again of the, the Zimmerman and Wright data from 2017. This is the undergraduates, um, about you know a little more than a thousand. And they filled out the IIPSC, so a measure of their interpersonal problems. And you get eight scales that are at different points of the circle that you can see here. And also the PDQ4, uh, which is a measure of personality pathology. And so these give you a bunch of uh, continuous numbers that tell you how much you're dealing with um, you know, symptoms related to different personality disorders. So it's not giving you just a yes or no, like, um, do you have a personality disorder? It's, it's much more about uh, measuring how much are you dealing with symptoms related to that disorder? So then we might have some research questions that we could answer with SSM, like, you know, what is the what is the interpersonal profile? Like, what types of problems um, do we see in the entire sample, or within groups within the sample, like just the men and just the women? So we can look at the entire sample. We can look at subgroups of the sample. Um, we also might take a correlate, like some of these uh, PDQ measures. Like the NARP is uh, basically the narcissistic um, scale, or the ASPD scale, which is the you know antisocial um, problem scale, and then we can use how much these um, measures correlate with the different octants to basically project or place those measures inside of the circle to say that like narcissistic PD uh, that scale is maybe more vindictive or domineering or non-assertive or whatever the case may be. Um, and then also one thing that's interesting that's a bit more advanced is you can also not just you know place each of these in the circle, but you can actually do contrasts. So if you wanna say like, do men and women differ? You could actually contrast those like and statistically test their difference or do NARPD and ASPD uh, scales differ? You could test those differences as well. Um, so just a quick example of how this works. Um, let's say we lay out our uh, eight octant scores. So maybe these are correlations of each of these octant scores with the NARPD. Uh, we can then basically replace each of these uh, labels with their position in the circle. So each has a specific position in the circle and we can number these. Um, so this is like zero degrees, this is 45, this is 90 and so on. So if we do this, then we end up with, instead of boxes, we end up with this kind of curve looking thing. And this is what you would expect um, for a prototypical uh, pattern or profile to look like, is this kind of curve. And there's reasons for that that have to do with some of the stuff that um, Ken talked about yesterday in the keynote, that basically the circumplex uh, structure of correlations between these basically um, requires it to take on a structure like this. And what we can then do is instead of having this represented by eight separate points, we can do like a curve fitting to try to fit a cosine curve to this. And so this is what it would look like if you fit a cosine curve uh, to this data. And essentially it's not perfect, right? Like we do have some error here and the amount of error is captured in what's called the R squared or the fit of the SSM model. 
And so if the fit is really bad, you know, then it's basically saying that like we couldn't find a cosine curve that approximates this profile. And so it's just, you know, don't trust the numbers that come from it. Um, but a lot of the time you do find that it is actually a pretty good fit. And we can use this again to represent um, the data. So instead of using eight numbers to represent these points in black, we can actually describe this cosine curve in just three numbers. Uh, and so those three numbers are what we call elevation. And that's basically how high or low is the center of the curve. And this is essentially interpreted as like the general factor, like the mean score. So if we're looking at interpersonal problems, then this would be like, you know, in general across all types of problems, how elevated are you? How much are you reporting having general interpersonal problems? Uh, there's also amplitude. So how peaked is the curve at its highest point? And that would be sort of like, how much are you really devoted to one type of interpersonal style or one type of interpersonal problem? And in a circle plot, which I'll show you in a moment, the amplitude tells you how far from the center are you. It doesn't tell you in what direction to move, but just how far from the center you are. And then displacement is the third number, which then tells you the direction. Are you moving from the center towards the bottom, towards the top, towards the left, towards the right, or some blend of those? And this is interpreted more as like, what is your style? Are you more dominant or a blend of cold and submissive or something? Um, so that, that's the basic idea. But one thing to just be careful of is that if your fit is really low, so like less than 0.7, you can still interpret elevation because it's just the mean, but amplitude and displacement shouldn't really be trusted. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, so just to give you a quick visualization, like I said, elevation is how high versus low your entire profile is shifted. Your amplitude is just how peaked you are at your highest point. And then displacement is like where is your highest point. So with those three numbers, you can create many, many different shapes of a cosine curve. And that's what we're basically reducing the profiles down to. OK, so let's quickly go through a couple examples of this, and then I'll show you um, you know, a preview, I guess, of this. So let's say we have the Jay-Z 2017 data that we can, uh, let's say, just load in from our, uh, it's very similar if you load it from CSV versus load it from the package. I think the only difference is the CSV version I standardized. Um, so let me just read that in. So let's say my data is read CSV Jay-Z 2017.csv. Okay, so yeah, now it's standardized. That'll make the mean plots a little bit more interpretable. So to do an SSM analysis, actually, I've tried to make this as easy and as intuitive and intuitive as possible. You would do overall SSM or really any name that you want to save the results into. And then you do SSM analyze. And then inside of this, you're going to again, again give it some arguments. So you're going to give it the data. So I think I had called it my data. And then you're going to give it, um, it needs to know what are the scales, um, what variables in that data set correspond to your scales. So we can again use that shortcut of PA to NO. And if you have them in that order from PA to NO, um, that's sort of like the standard order, then you can basically say angles equals octants, and it will automatically figure out, um, you know, kind of what angle each of those is in. If you don't do it that way, if they're in some other weird order, you actually have to give it a vector where you say, you know, the first is at 90 degrees and then 135 and then 180 and so on. But if you always make it PA to NO, which is what you'll always get if you use my score function, then you can just say octants. Uh, and if you were had some other circumflex measure that gave you uh, quadrants or, I don't know, 12 scales or something, then you can uh, give the angles there and it'll still work. Um, but again, in this field, most of us use octant uh, measures. So that's kind of what it's optimized for. Uh, it'll run, only takes a couple seconds despite bootstrapping 2,000 times. Um, and that was, uh, I was pretty proud of the, the speed I was able to achieve for that. Uh, and then if we want to understand, okay, well, what results did we get? 
we can do summary and then overall SSM. And then it'll tell us, okay, we did the SSM using mean scores. So it just took the mean profile of everybody in the sample. It did 2000 resamples. Again, these are the scale displacements that it used. And then it'll give us an estimate of those parameters. Um, so basically the elevation, the X and Y values, um, these are all zero, uh, which is a little strange, but I think it's because I standardized them. And then uh, what the displacement is, but this model fit is pretty poor. Um, but I'll give you some other examples where the fit will be better. Um, so that's basically what you can do. If you want to get a, a nice looking table of results, you can do SSM table and then overall SSM. And then down here in your viewer, you'll see it'll format basically like a publication ready table for you. Um, and if you had asked for multiple groups, it would just have another row for every group. Um, so that should make that pretty easy. And you can also do SSM plot to do uh, a plot of it. And then you'll see here that, uh, again, we're kind of having this strange, um, <laughs> uh, let me do instead of the, uh, maybe the standardization was a bad idea. Let me do the, uh, the original one. So I'm going to come up here, instead of using my data, let's just use Jay-Z 2017. And then if we plot that one, yeah, yeah, that's more what I was expecting to see. So then you'll see that the, um, you know, the people are down here uh, overall. And then from here, it's, it's, it's very easy to customize things where if instead of getting the entire sample, if you wanted something like, um, you know, you wanted to do just maybe men and women, you could do grouping equals gender. And then if you do uh, SSM plot overall SSM, then you'll see it'll plot men and women separately. Um, and then again, you could do other things like measure equals uh, NAR PD. Uh, or I think it's measures, sorry. And then we can do uh, SSM plot, and then you'll see NAR PD is up here too. So I think we're a bit out of time at this point, but let me just give you one final uh, pointer here. Um, if you're interested in learning more, you can go to the package website. Um, so this is circumplex.jmgerard.com, and I can copy this into Zoom chat as well. And basically, all the stuff that I talked about today is on the website. So if we go to it, you'll see here there's a bunch of examples. And in particular, if you go to instruments, you can get information about any instrument in the package uh, on the website without even using R. And if you go to vignettes, these are little um, examples that walk you through how to use instruments. You can go to intro to SSM, and it'll walk you through what the SSM is and how to use it, uh, similar to what I just did, but probably too quickly. <laughs> and then uh, also more uh, intermediate or more advanced SSM stuff as well for doing things like uh, contrasts. Um, so thank you for your attention. Sorry, I kind of ran out of time here, went over a little bit at the end, um, but happy to, to talk to anyone more about this maybe during uh, one of the breaks, uh, if anyone's interested.